Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to another episode of the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. I'm Adam, your co-host. For those of you who might watch our live stream, this is our second one this weekend. We talked about threat and vulnerability management yesterday, which we're going to push off publishing that one until next week. We are going to talk about a critical vulnerability that has the internet on fire. If you haven't heard, there is a vulnerability out there that affects the Log4j library that's dubbed as Log4Shell. Adam, can you give our listeners an idea of what Log4j is? Yeah, so Log4j is an open source Java-based logging library. And for our listeners that may not be developers or may not understand kind of how software is built today, you reuse as many pieces as possible when you write software. So as opposed to you as a software developer saying, I need to write an ability for my software to write logs, you'd instead go find a library that is already built that already does that because there's no sense reinventing the wheel, so to speak. And so, so much of software today is built on these different libraries where there's libraries that implement SSL, you know, secure communications. There's libraries that implement logging like this one here, log4j. There's libraries that implement drawing to the graphical user interface. So this is, this is standard practice nowadays in how software is built. Uh, log4j, you may hear associated with Apache. So a little bit of computer history for, for those not familiar with that. Apache, many, many years ago now in kind of the Linux and Unix community, was an open source web server. It's kind of how it got its start. And it grew into this entire Apache software foundation. They actually have their own Apache license for open source software. And there's many different projects under that umbrella, of which Log4j is one of them. And Log4j is included in many frameworks as well. So a framework can be a multiple libraries kind of stitched together to help software developers get even further down the path where they have to begin writing the unique code to make their app do what they need it to do. So frameworks like Struts, uh, Solar, Druid, and Flink all leverage and have built in the Log4j open source library as well. And, and so on a versioning note, before we get any farther, there are two major releases of Log4j to date. There was Log4j 1.0 and its series of releases, and then 2.0. 2.0 came out in summer of 2014, and that is the subject of conversation for today. So, so 1.0 actually is not part of this discussion. It's not vulnerable. Only Log4j 2.0 is. And so from this kind of description I'm giving you, hopefully what you begin to understand is there are going to be many, many, many different software packages, either written in-house by your own IT and application development teams, as well as professional off-the-shelf enterprise software that leverage this, as well as SaaS applications on the public internet too. So lots of different computer code might leverage this library to do its thing. And just one last note too, this being open source software, nobody has to pay for it. It's free to use and anyone can inspect the code. The code is out there. You could go read all of the code that makes up this app at any time. And it's maintained by three volunteer part-time developers. Like so much open source software is, it's people doing the work in their spare time with no compensation for it. So I want to provide all of that information up front because I think it'll frame the rest of the conversation. So now, Andy, if you would, why don't you tell our listeners about why we're having this conversation today on the log for shell vulnerability. So CVE 2021-44228 was published on December 9th of this year, and it is now being dubbed as log for shell. And what it is, is it's a vulnerability within the log for J library that allows for remote code execution and RCE, which is 
the worst type of vulnerability that you can think of when you're talking about any type of vulnerability. It was rated as the highest risk, a 10 out of 10 on the CVSS uh, scoring. Essentially, what it allows an attacker to do is to form a string that can be used as an input onto a server to uh, to fetch code or run code from a remote system and executing it. It uses something called the Java Naming and Directory Interface or the JNDI or JINDI. And so it uses the JINDI attacks and it makes a call out to an LDAP server, which will then be configured with a refer to send it back to an HTTP server, which will then execute and run more code. So the victim will execute arbitrary code hosted by an attacker. So one of the examples is changing your iPhone name to a specific string, a Jindy attack, and then it'll result in contacting Apple servers with this remote code execution attack. You can also do your Twitter handle. A lot of people started changing their Twitter handles to the string that will conduct a Jindy attack. Minecraft was the first one to report this attack in the wild. Attackers were using it to enter in the command into the chat, and then that would run arbitrary code on the Minecraft servers. And once you're starting to run this code, it can run different programs. It could run a shell to escalate or laterally move within your organization. There are a lot of organizations as Adam mentioned, that are using this Log4j. And just to name a few, Apple, Amazon, Cloudflare, Twitter, Steam, Minecraft, VMware, all of their applications are being affected because they use Log4j. And just before this recording of this show, I read a blog that said Unify, the servers, um, the... Um, the uh, controller for Unify is affected as well. And so I use Unify controllers for my network gear, and I had to upgrade to the latest operating system to mitigate this. Jamf is also one of the vendors that are affected. And so we're going to post a GitHub that actually has a list of vendors, and it's very, very long, who have put out either a press release or have a Twitter or something that they're doing to uh, mitigate or upgrade their services, upgrade their code, whatever it is. And you can take a look to see if you're using any one of these vendors and what their release is going to say about the vulnerability. So in the sense of transparency, Andy and I frequently mention we both work for Microsoft on this show. Although, again, always also clarify we do the show on our own time outside of work and Microsoft has no editorial control or has never asked for editorial control of the show. So, you know, full separation from work and personal. This is a personal project. Uh, but but do um, want to be open and transparent about kind of where our employer sits. So Microsoft is in the process of performing a cross-company effort to identify any places where Log4j might be used and might be vulnerable. Because of Microsoft's kind of unique position in that, you know, we're, we're really the only major platform um, that's not Linux or Unix-based at this point and, and doesn't have as much open-source software. Most of our products are closed-source, and, you know, most of our services are built on those closed-source solutions. I would expect... Microsoft to probably be less impacted by this than other organizations. We have not made any public disclosures to this point outside of Minecraft, which is fully based on Java and is a Microsoft product and is already fully patched. And, you know, we'll talk about that as we go along. Um, and then also as we go along, uh, Microsoft Defender Antivirus, as well as Microsoft Defender for Endpoint, the EDR solution, have built in some detections. And we'll talk about those at the appropriate part of the conversation. Um for these vulnerabilities, but just want to kind of mention that up front when we're talking about other vendors, um, we didn't leave Microsoft out. Just Microsoft, as of recording time, has not mentioned any impact from this to date. So just want to be, again, open and transparent about that. 
So as we continue the discussion of this log four shell vulnerability, this was initially discovered by the Alibaba cloud security team. That's a, a Chinese organization. And it was properly disclosed to Apache. So it was disclosed, I believe the date was November 24th. And so Apache did diligently work to patch and correct this issue. And they released that fix this week. I believe uh, if I remember correctly, that's version 2.15 of Log4j corrects the issue and changes the default behavior. So there is no longer an impact from it. Uh, Andy, I think you made some sort of quote around the internet being on fire, which was, I think, CrowdStrike's quote. Uh, the folks over at Tenable, at least their CEO, described this vulnerability as the single biggest, most critical vulnerability of the last decade. And uh, cybersecurity professionals are sometimes known to hyperbole, but that might be a fair assumption. And the reason why is the severity of the vulnerability, but also the ubiquity of the vulnerability. There is so much of this used all over the place, and it's hard to know just how frequently this library has been used because there's so many libraries out there nowadays, especially in open source software that are so frequently used without even giving it a second's thought and sometimes not even kept up to date that um, they're just everywhere. If you remember the Heartbleed vulnerability from many years ago, that was a similar situation where that was a vulnerability in the open SSL library and tons and tons and tons of software vendors, applications, line of business apps were impacted for the same reason because OpenSSL was like the standard library everybody used to establish secure communication channels. So this is similar to that, but logging is even more ubiquitous for applications than creating a secure channel because maybe not every app needs to communicate over a secure channel, but practically Every application needs to log what it's doing. So this is this is a big one for sure. Don't even think that's hyperbole. Uh, it's remote code execution. So to be clear, it requires no local authentication and no local access. No authentication period, I should say, and no local access to exploit. You don't need anything. You can just hit a remote system. Um, it's being actively exploited in the wild right now, although it turns out, to date, most of that behavior hasn't been terribly malicious outside of like crypto miners and stuff like that. And so we'll talk about that a little more as we go along. So that's a kind of good overview of what the Vuln is, you know, what the seriousness of it is and, and where it all came from. So, you know, now we get into the, well, what should you do? You know, what, what action should you take? And, you know, my thought on this is this is as close to the sky is falling as we will ever get in cybersecurity. Sometimes we really do cry wolf and get a little worked up over things that maybe aren't that big of a deal. This is as big of a deal as it gets. This really is crying wolf, sky is falling. It's bad. However, that doesn't mean it's time to go off and start acting like a cowboy. It doesn't mean it's time to go do things without consulting with management or going through proper approval channels. This is an all hands on deck situation, but it's still a measure twice cut once situation. So make sure you're being thoughtful about the actions you take because yes, it's important to get this protected as fast as you can, but we still have to do that in the most diligent way possible and, and kind of weigh our options. So one of the suggestions I'd like to make is, you know, go use this great resource that sometimes can be used for good called Twitter and go look up some professionals. So those of you who have been longtime listeners of the Blue Security Podcast remember that we had the gal who literally wrote the book on application security, Tanya Jenka, on the show um, many moons ago now. It was really early, I believe, in, in the year 2021. Uh, she was a phenomenal guest because she published a book, Alice and Bob Learn Application Security. So one of the first things I did when I wanted to go, go learn more is I looked up her essentially her Twitter feed. I wanted to see what she'd been posting. And sure enough, Tanya had posted a thread with some recommendations and guidance on, you know, here's your options and laying them out for you. And, and she gets it, you know, she, she understands this stuff cold. So use your resources, use your tools and make sure that as you are putting all of your options on the table, you know, you're getting those options from the best possible sources. And then we can go over those options and figure out our best course of action. Um, one thing I like to think about too with this is I, I think there's really kind of two distinct swim lanes here as we address the problem. 
So number one, I think there's a swim lane for enterprise software, software that's made by somebody else, because a lot of that is going to be determine if that software is impacted, get with that vendor, see what their mitigation is. Are you waiting for a patch? Is there a configuration change you can go make? Do they recommend you just shut it off and wait? You know, figure that out. The second swim lane, line of business applications that your company has written in-house. And so it's very likely your company has used many open source libraries over the years and probably this one. And so many of your line of business applications that your company relies on may be subject to using this library as well. And so that's also going to be a separate process you need to go through to determine, you know, how widely used is this in your own code and what are options to mitigate that. So kind of two different processes, I think, two different swim lanes to think about it as you, you know, work towards mitigating this threat. Yeah. And when you're looking at in-house code, you know, as a software vendor, if you're actually pushing out applications to your customers and users, that's one different thing, right? If, if you're actually coding things and selling them, if it's line of business, it might just be applications that you're running in-house behind say your firewall or you have to be on vpn to get to so that changes the urgency of whether or not you need to you know patch right away or you know maybe you have a little bit of time because that changes the risk it changes the the threat uh landscape so for in-house software you can definitely search your repos to see if you're using log4j any type of dependency checkers that you have, check your libraries. There are a lot of application security tools that are out there. When Tanya was on the show, she didn't necessarily mention any of them. She probably had her own favorite ones at previous company. I used Veracode. A Veracode is also compared to a lot of other ones in that space, like White Source, Sonar Cube, Check Marks. They're basically code scanning tools that will look at any type of code that you've written and then look at the libraries that are associated with it and then give you a score of how vulnerable that software is. Oftentimes it'll look at these third-party libraries and say, oh, there's an update for this and you should go and update your code to pull the latest library. You obviously want to work with your application teams to test that code, but this is one of those things where if you have a good application security program, the developers are usually checking in with InfoSec and looking and, and asking for recommendations. Oftentimes they would scan their code and they would see that a certain library is out of date or it has a vulnerability. This is going to show up as a critical. Absolutely. And in my guidance to those teams was always a critical must be remediated and it has to be remediated probably outside of their normal sprint cycles. This is one of those emergency patches that they got to do. Um, so again, you know, if it's in-house code and it's not externally facing, maybe not as pressing, but if it's web facing, if it's something that is a customer app, you're going to want to remediate this. If you are running web services, you know, most likely you have a waft as well a web application firewall and the WAF service providers have been updating their rules to block this vulnerability. So check with your WAF provider to see if there's an updated rule that you can just go and implement to block this from getting uh, exploited on your code. Now, as Adam said, the 1.0 versions are not affected. So if you're checking your libraries and you see the 1.0 versions or in that series, you don't have to worry about it. If you're running a 2.x, then you're going to need to update. 2.15 is the one that you want to update to. A lot of different things that you can do. So let's say you, you have code that is using this library and it's not up to date. Obviously, one of the things that you can do is update to the latest one. But let's say you can't do that. It's a critical app. You can't take it down. You haven't tested it. Or maybe they do test it and it breaks. And so you need other things to mitigate it. 
you could accept the risk. That's not the greatest uh, thing that you could do, and it's certainly not going to make uh, InfoSec happy. But you could accept the risk and monitor for uh, in, uh, indicators of compromise. So if you have a SIM, you can update the rules. Azure Sentinel has a query. You can look for the software name equals uh, lib log 4 j 2 java and that will give you instances of where that library is being pulled. There's also Yara and other detection rules that you can update in other sims like Splunk. Grainoise is also publishing a list of IP addresses that they're seeing who is scanning for vulnerable endpoints. And so you can possibly put those IPs on a list to block in your network. Your EDR solutions probably have updated. As Adam said, Microsoft Defender for Endpoint has updated definitions to look for this exploit. Other EDR solutions like CrowdStrike have updated as well. I know Zscaler put out a uh, public post that said their signatures were updated. You could possibly shut off the vulnerable systems until you get a handle on everything. Maybe that's something that you're looking at and the risk is just too great. You're like, we'll just shut it off. You might just turn off logging. I mean, that's not a great thing either, but maybe you could just comment out the impacted code and turn off the logging for that particular application. You could write your own blocking code. One of the things that was implemented in this Log4j version 2.1 was a property called format MSG no lookups. What you could do is just go into the config and set that property to true, which means that there's no lookups, which will then prevent this vulnerability from getting exploited on your code. You could also remove the JNDI lookup class from the class path. You just get rid of that completely and that will also mitigate it. So, a lot of different things that you could do if you can't update to the latest version. You want to work, obviously, with your information security team, your application security team, and your developers to see what the impact is. But the best thing to do is to just update your code to the latest version, which will then mitigate it. What the latest version does is set that format MSG no lookups to true automatically, whereas in past versions, it was set to false. Now, what happens if you are using vendor software like VMware right now? Many of their, uh, you know, VMware Workstation, VMware, uh, the server um, uh, software that's running, the identity is all based, it all has Log4j. Now, what happens if you're using that or other software that's affected by it? Well, you could wait for a patch because I'm sure those companies right now, their developers are rushing and they're working overtime to, f to put out a patch for their software. You could also just do some manual detection. If you don't have an application that is running it and you're just looking for third-party software that is possibly running this type of code, there's a security um, researcher that has a, and I'll put the, the link in the show notes, but he has a, um, a Python script that you can run to just look for remnants within your logs to see if log4j uh, has been used. So there are, there are tools out there. We're going to publish some of them in the links here. You could just look in your logs. You can look at uh, your EDR solution. You can scan your infrastructure using some um, known network-facing endpoints with curl commands to see if the hosts are responding to this particular exploit. And you obviously can check in with your software vendors. Check their web pages with that GitHub uh, that we're going to put with all the different vendors and their public statements check to see what public statements they have made because I'm sure if you put in a support ticket right now, they're just slammed. So, um, or maybe you just take the systems offline until you get a response from your vendors. So as Adam said, 
this exploit is being seen in the wild. However, at this point, we've only seen crypto miners and some botnets who are using it. It's fairly benign activity not to trivialize or marginalize this vulnerability and the activity, but it hasn't been associated with any type of ransomware or actual remote code execution Trojans or uh, any type of um, beaconing that we've seen. It's, it's purely just botnet traffic at this point and crypto miners. So I'm sure that at some point, probably pretty quickly in the future, that it may be associated with other things. But for now, wait for your software vendors. The major vendors are probably working overtime to get new versions pushed out to you. And then when they do get pushed out, make sure that you're patching your software. So there's a vaccine. This is clever. (laughs) I, I, I like this. I like this a lot. So cyber reason has released a vaccine public free open source, by the way, uh, that actually uses the vulnerability itself to break into the server and then make that change to the configuration settings. Remember the thing Andy talked about with the format message, no lookup thing. It does that. It goes and flips that bit, that Boolean to be true um, using the vulnerability to do it, which is like the most brilliant thing ever. So this is awesome. Um, You know, this could be the easiest and fastest way to fix your environment really, because you could literally, you know, kind of port scan your own environment internally, you know, on your internal IP range for vulnerable systems and just have the vaccine go deploy itself and boom, we're done. We patched all the systems. Yay us. Um, I, I would say the one thing that would concern me is with this, not that there's anything malicious here. I mean, again, if you can audit all the code, right? It's that you might have line of business apps that actually like do things with those lookups or something, or maybe vendor applications are using those lookups for some purpose. And by deploying this vaccine to everything, yes, you've protected yourself, but you might've broken stuff. So I don't know how real that risk is. Maybe this is very, very minor and I'm, I'm overstating it. And you might more, be more willing to take that risk. Cause it's like the known risk is there's a remote code execution. That's a 10 on a CVSS and, and the unlikely event, this breaks some code, then we'll, we'll, take that as it comes, you know, but we'd rather just be safer here. I think that's a completely acceptable play. Remember how I said earlier about, you know, let's not be cowboys. Let's still measure twice, cut once. This is an option you can bring to your leadership team and say, well, Hey, you know, I've got this cool option. I've got this vaccine and it will protect us. There's the potential of side effects. Um, in this case, should we do it? And if you get the go ahead, man, yeah, I mean, hit your whole IP range, get it done. Um, this is, this is really cool stuff. So I, I love clever things like this. This reminds me of there was, who was doing this Andy with the exchange vulnerabilities where they're actually using the exchange volumes to break in and then patch the exchange servers. Who was doing that? Was it like the FBI or something? I think it was a government agency yeah, that yeah. was going in and doing that yeah. for their customers so the, or for, for companies. Yeah. So this is cool. I, I do like this. This is really clever. So very neat. Um, okay. Did you have any thoughts on the vaccine before we kind of move on to lessons learned? Yeah. You know, as far as the vaccine goes, I, I did read a couple of uh, posts that said the configuration change. If you're using the vulnerability to do this doesn't stick. So if the machine reboots, You'll have to run it again. Um, And you could probably trip some of your EDR solutions or other security (laughs) tools by running this, obviously, since they're looking for the use of the vulnerability. So it is an interesting way to do it. um, And it's certainly quick. But just know that what like what Adam said, there are some some side effects, some things that may break. the configurations may not be permanent and and i would definitely consider this a temporary fix like you want to upgrade the library um or you want to wait for your vendors to update their software i mean those are the permanent fixes to remediate this uh, this flipping the flag uh is is a temporary thing that's a that's a good call i didn't realize myself this was temporary so yeah i 100 this is buying time which it still could buy you 
you know, depending on how often you reboot, maybe a lot of time, but it's still just buying you time to, to do the fix the right way. So good stuff there for sure. Um, okay. So lessons learned, like, you know, what, what, what are we going to learn from all of this? Well, I think for a lot of you, maybe you want to catch up on some sleep first before we talk about lessons learned. Uh, but I was going to start with being kind, you know, to our InfoSec teams or AppSec teams, app dev teams this week. Gosh, you know, nobody planned to spend a, a weekend in December, you know, near the holiday season, uh, working all weekend. And I'm sure it's been a miserable weekend of work. So if you know anybody who has, you know, got caught up in this and spent a lot of time working, you know, hats off to y'all for keeping us safe. Thank you for your hard work. Um, it is appreciated. And, you know, on top of that too, Andy, I think we talked about in the pre-show and I mentioned at the very top of the, the show while we were on the air that the Log4j library is maintained by three part-time volunteer contributors. They are unpaid and it is not their day job. And maybe it should be given this is critical infrastructure for so much of the information technology community, but that's where we sit today. And people have been attacking them as well. And that's unacceptable. I think they, they were doing the best job they can. Um, and that's really going to seg into my segue into my next point, which is Tanya Jenka made this when she was on our show that there is a misplaced belief that open source software is magically more secure, automatically more secure than closed source software. And the thought process is by being able to review and audit the code, some sort of security fairy somewhere will go through, you know, GitHub and, you know, fix all the security vulnerabilities just by virtue of being able to read code. And there's people out there gonna, that are going to do that out of the goodness of their hearts um, when they could instead be, you know, collecting bug bounties from big tech. And it turns out that's just not the case. So this version of Log4j version 2.0 was released in 2014, summer of 2014. It has been out in the public with this vulnerability for seven years, seven and a half years, really. And in that time, having that code sit out there certainly hasn't bubbled up with enough attention the fact that there is this vulnerability. Andy, I think you said... Um, there was actually a black hat presentation on this in 2016. So two years later that disclosed this vulnerability and talked about it at length. And I don't know what happened where the disconnect was that that didn't turn into, you know, a CVE and proper disclosure and being patched and fixed. But the, the point stands that open source software is great. I am not anti open source software, but we do need to keep in mind. One of my favorite adages in general is always follow the money. Security researchers want to put food on their table and a roof over their heads. And that means evaluating code from companies that pay bug bounties. Oftentimes that is closed source software. And so there are a lot of people digging through closed source software and responsibly disclosing those vulnerabilities. And they are being responsibly and timely patched before they become an issue. So, uh, just, I, I think this, this does provide a really teachable moment that we build so much infrastructure on top of open source software with this kind of naive assumption that it is really secure code by virtue of it just being open source. But that in and of itself doesn't magically lead to better code. And in a lot of cases, you know, closed source really can compete because of the nature of capitalism and security researchers wanting to, you know, make money themselves. And they're going to go to where the money is and, and where they get paid. So it, it's just a point to, to think about the next time you want to fire up a tired debate that, you know, company X is insecure because we hear about them in the news all the time. And these, you know, security researchers are always reporting vulnerabilities in their software. And I never hear about them in open source. Well, maybe they're there. They're just not being discovered because there's no money in it, you know? So just, just food for thought as we move forward. Uh, and, and then as well, we've talked on this show in the past around having that great plan. I think Andy, you talked about how, you know, airline pilots or, or any pilot, they have a checklist, you know, they pull it off the shelf or it's in their electronic flight bag or however it is today. And they go through the checklist. Okay. You know, we lost an engine. What do we do? You know, do this, do this, do this. Um, you talked about having that playbook. You can pull off the shelf to say, we just suffered a breach. What do we do? 
Uh, it turns out we might need one of those for a really bad zero day as well, because it moves beyond normal operational activity for the security operations and security engineering teams, where we need larger level decision-making on some of these because how impactful they are, because we might need executive sign-off to say, Hey, you know, we're an insurance company and we have, I'm just making up an example here. We have the ability to quote new policies online on our website, but it's impacted by this vulnerability and we could suffer a major breach if we don't do something. And, you know, when we tried to patch it, it broke our code and it went down in, in our dev environment. So we need to take our, our website offline and stop requesting new insurance quotes till we figure this out. Like that's when you need executive leadership all the way up the food chain to sign off on that decision making. And so that's where you need playbooks for stuff like this, I think, moving forward. So uh, lesson learned for all of us here that, you know, security operations teams might need to have that plan in place or, or that, um, you know, response team they can spin up and get all the different stakeholders involved to walk through how we're going to mitigate the zero day and all of the people we need involved to help make that happen as efficiently as possible. So we can learn some things from this too, once we've caught our breath and protected our organizations. Software supply chain attacks like this one are one of the biggest nightmares for application security teams, infosec teams. It's not the first time, like Adam mentioned, with the Heartbleed and the SSL libraries. Developers often use these libraries without thinking twice. So if you have developers at your company, I mean, you should be doing code review with them. You should have an application security team, should be doing code review, should be looking at out of date libraries and updating them in a programmatic cycle. You shouldn't just let them go and they should be checking in with you. When we were running the application security program at my previous org, we would scan the code. They would come to us with recommendations on when they could remediate certain vulnerabilities that they found in their code. And we would recommend if it was a critical one that they do it out of cycle. And so this is a constant thing. Code is done in sprints. It is um, a, an iterative cycle. And so you need to be on top of this sort of stuff. One of the things that I am just floored at is the InfoSec community response to all of this. The amount of um, POCs and GitHubs and um, video demonstrations, uh, threat intel reports that have been published in just the last couple of days on this topic have been phenomenal. And I think the entire InfoSec community has banded together to try to help one another to get through this and remediate as much as they can so that very little, you know, if any folks are going to be affected. So I have a, an optimistic outlook on the, the InfoSec um, state that we have, you know, people are saying that, um, you know, we're getting attacked all the time and defenders are behind, but, Again, I feel optimistic in the fact that I think that we are in one of the most alert, alertful states that I've ever seen in the fact that how fast we're mobilizing, how fast the information is getting out there, and how fast companies are actually making changes and pushing out new code and updating that I think it's going to be it's going to be a good thing in the future. I mean, we're always going to find code like this. This is not going to be new. But how the response is is going to be extremely important. I love that call out because, you know, an example that I've been talking about a lot recently um, is if you are solely focused on outcomes all of the time, then you lose sight of what the correct process is. So for example, if you are, I'm just going to give you like a really, really simple example here to kind of make my point. If you're playing like high card, you know, I, I've got a deck of cards, pull a card. Okay. It's a three. Andy, do you think the next card's going to be higher or lower? I mean, higher. it's going to be higher, right? Like that's the correct play every time. If I pull out a two, does that mean your decision was wrong? No, 
you should guess higher every single time if I pull out a three, because it is almost always going to be higher. Now, does that mean 100% of the time? Does that mean it's always the right move? Well, yeah, because you're, you're playing the, you know, you're playing the probabilities. So if you p- pull that two afterwards and say, man, see, I should have, I should have gone lower. No, you shouldn't have. And so you're letting results get in the way of the right process of the right decision-making decision-making, especially in things like infosec is made with incomplete information. We're doing the best that we can with the information we have available to us. Now, just because a result happens a certain way, doesn't mean our decision-making was flawed. And so the, where people get this wrong is when they, they will go back and say, Oh, see, I was wrong. I should have done it this way. Not true in all cases. So the, the, the point I'm getting at here is, kind of adding on to what Andy's saying, this is all about the process. This is about how you respond to it, how you uh, make changes going forward. Because ultimately, as much as this draws a ton of concern for how many of these low-level open source libraries are ubiquitous across the majority of the computer code that runs today, not nothing's going to happen to rip all of that out tomorrow or in five years or even in 10 years. Like I don't see wholesale changes coming to the fact that a lot of these libraries are just so, so, so common. They're not going anywhere and they may have vulnerabilities lurking and we may go through this whole process again. And I don't see a magic answer to it. I don't see a way this suddenly gets solved unless You know, maybe big tech gets together and forms like the big tech open source, you know, security bug bounty program or something, you know, sponsored by Amazon and Apple and Google and Microsoft or whomever. And then everyone goes and has a great bug bash on all these open source libraries. But unless something like that happens where you literally have like massive corporate benefactors, this is going to happen again, you know? And, And so if we keep our focus on what can we control at our company? What can we do so we're ready to respond to the next one? That's the best thing to do. Focus on what's within your circle of control, and you'll be so much better off than worrying about what's happening outside of your circle of control. And so I think that's another really valuable lesson here. So I like what you were saying there, Andy. That's our show for this week. Look for our Threat and Vulnerability Management Program podcast episode next week. As always, our contact information will be in the show notes. If you have any questions or topics you want us to talk about, shoot us an email, find us on Twitter, and we will do our best to talk about those topics. Thanks, and we'll talk to you guys next week. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJawZero and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.